We have an action-packed day this morning, so we're going to run straight into it. Let's bring up Father Jack with a warm welcome. Woo-hoo! Yes, the month of Mary, we're in that. You won't have to endure me asking you, may the fourth be with you. I won't say that. Uh, oh, I just did. Well, there you go. It's actually the fifth, though. There we go. Uh, let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, I love you above all things, and I love my neighbor for your sake, because you are the highest, infinite, and perfect good, worthy of all my love. In this love I intend to live and die. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. During the course of the year, we covered the uh, act of faith, hope, and love, or charity. So those three prayers are important prayers, I think, often neglected, forgotten, but those were often taught. Uh, to those of us who are preparing uh, for sacraments back in the day. We want to do a summary. We've been through the seven sacraments this year. Next year, we'll look at Christian life and how we're called to live that life. But in summary, the sacraments, what are they? We, we have different definitions, but as we sum this up today, I wanted to kind of look at it a bit more broadly and simply. Signs from heaven. In other words, we need some sign that God is active in our life. We need to see things because we're incarnate, but there's things that need to happen that we know by faith. So there's things we can look at and there's words we can hear that by faith we believe activate the life of God in us and in our world. So the signs from heaven uniting us to our origin, that is God, and directing us on our way to our destiny. Again, that's God. We come from God to return from him, which is perfect communion with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with the holy angels and saints. So these signs remind us that we come from God, and these signs direct us towards God, but also with all those angels and saints who also desire to have their wills united to the will of God. Seven signs, they are signs, we can see them, that affect what they signify. You see something, words are said, and it happens, the effect. So, think about this. If you correlate to natural events, the supernatural events of our church, rebirth from above through adoption by grace, that's what baptism it is, that because of our original parents turning away from God the Father to the Father of lies so that they themselves could define what is good or evil, now we turn back to the Father and allow him to the reveal the truth to his son who tells us what is good and evil. And so what happens is we are adopted to the father by grace so that we can live as his children here on earth as we journey towards heaven. Growth, in other words, yes, we're born, but we develop physically. Well, spiritually also we develop. This is our ongoing conversion. If you look at it this way, your body's kind of in an ongoing conversion. It's getting mature. It's growing up. There's a point where you couldn't have children. There's a point where you could. There's a development within your body. And in the same way, as we mature, we begin to take on the responsibility of spiritual children. We begin to father and mother children in our relationships or in our particular vocations and capacities. We need to be fed. So growth in strength as a disciple to give witness as an apostle. Okay? So we see that's in confirmation. We're strengthened. Remember, we're fed with food. That'll be the Eucharist. The next we'll talk about. We're strengthened. Just like we feed the body, we also exercise the body. If you look at it this way, confirmation is about exercising after you've been nourished and fed. If you're just fed, you get fat. But if you are fed and work out, you get strong. You see, we know that it, we know that most definitely in the physical life. Just eating food's not enough. Just coming and receiving communion's not enough. We need to exercise that in the power of the Spirit to strengthen what has been nourished. So the strengthening is the Holy Spirit. The growth in strength is the disciple to give witness as an apostle. That's what confirmation is, what we see in Pentecost. And spiritual nourishment for the development. In other words, we're nourished to to respond to the strengthening and to have those speak to each other, both nourishment and growth. For the development in holiness and in communion with God and with neighbor. This Eucharist nourishes our baptism. The confirmation strengthens it. 
healing of the soul. However, we get wounded. You might work out, you get injured. Um, you, might, you might go out and play, you get injured. Well, in the same way, in the spiritual life, it's a contact sport, we get injured. We're weak, we meet other weak people, we tend to fall into sin. And so therefore, we have the healing of the soul wounded by sin through reconciliation. Uh, sometimes, uh, we also are suffering physically and are tempted to give up the way of the cross. We have cancer and suddenly we're scared that we might turn away from God because of how overwhelmed we are by this, this impact on us. So a deeper union with the cross of Christ through anointing of the sick. The anointing of the sick mostly unites our suffering to the cross of Christ. That's the general effect of the sacrament. The purpose of it is so that we don't lose hope in the midst of our physical trial. It may physically heal us, okay? If we're unable to go to confession, it may heal us of sin too. It will, okay? But the point is, essentially what it's about is conforming our suffering to what Christ has suffered on the cross. He took our infirmities upon him. So we say, okay, since you've taken your my infirmity upon yourself, I now accept my infirmity in union with you who already took that infirmity upon yourself as Isaiah tells us in scripture. A deeper union with the cross of Christ and acceptance of his way. And then finally, living in communion and on mission that we're nourished, we're strengthened, we are children of God and we live to be in union with each other and to gather more people to that union. In other words, we're supposed to deepen our relationships that we already have and bring other people to these relationships that we have. That's the mission and communion. And if you look at our, the purpose of holy orders, mission and communion. If we look at the purpose of marriage, communion and mission. Okay, so these are, are speak to each other. Okay, and then the summary then, the Father's gifts to restore our life as his children. That's what the sacraments are. His crucified son, what do we receive from the crucified son? The water of our baptism and of our reconciliation. Uh, the, the healing, we are healed by the wounds of Christ. If we look at the crucified Christ, we have the water of our baptism, which is also the water of our reconciliation, and we also have the wounds of Christ by which we are healed. That's what Peter tells us. By his wounds we are healed. We also see the blood that represents the Eucharist from the crucified Christ. We also see holy orders because he is priest and victim. So we see that the priest is called to unite his life in the sacrifice of the son and to give his life in the name of the son and to give the son through that. Also marriage is the same death. Death to self so that you give yourself to the other partner. Why? Because Christ is the bridegroom and we as members of his body are the bride. From the cross we see a nuptial event. Uh, Christ and his church. Okay, so we have a child. The last Adam, Jesus, the new Eve, Mary, and the child, John. Okay, it's a nuptial reflection. And then when you get married, I, I usually like my couples to hold in their hands a cross to, so that they don't get deceived and think marriage is going to be easy. There's this, there's this type of deception that takes place. You know, it's kind of like when you've had a little bit too much wine, you feel really good, and the next day you feel bad. Well, marriage can be a little bit like that. That's why I have a wedding feast, right? So, so I try to say, you know, you know you're, you're going to be crucified. This will be a death, okay? Um, which is what it's meant to be. Uh, there's a bowing down one to the other. Uh, the Mary, our spiritual mother. Remember, also we're given Mary. We're not only given Jesus, but we're given Mary, our spiritual mother. She's the icon of the church as a mother. We were given Christ uh, on Holy Thursday and Good Friday. And on Good Friday, we're also given a spiritual mother. We're given the Holy Spirit in baptism and in confirmation um, is deepened. The Holy Spirit, we're baptized in water and the Spirit in parts. And in confirmation, we're strengthened in that same Holy Spirit. Remember, God gave us personal relationships. He gave us Jesus. Jesus gave us himself and Mary. And then... The Father and the Son give us the Holy Spirit. It's, he gives us persons. He gives us relationships. Okay? So, are we, all, are we finished here? Let's see. Uh, final questions. We're going to move to the questions. So, we wanted to go briefly with that summary because what we want to look at is I got 20 questions today to summarize the whole year. 
I have some real zingers and curveballs for you to just irritate you and perplex you. And then out of that confusion that I've created, we'll bring order and clarity. So we're going to do 20 questions, and we're also going to do a bit of a mission wrap-up and a little something else. Are you ready to flex your muscles today? 20 questions for us. Father Jack's got some, like you said, real zingers in there. So this is the portion we'll go through these true and false questions and allow you five minutes at the table to discuss these questions as they come up. But bear with me as we read through them together. We'll start together with number one. The f- it's coming. <laughs> number one. At the particular judgment, a person's soul separates from his or her body and, after God's judgment, goes either to heaven, hell, or purgatory. Number two. The sacraments of Christian initiation are baptism, reconciliation, and the Eucharist. Number three. Everlasting love is ultimately determined uniquely by each individual human person according to his or her particular views and feelings. Number four. God created man and woman originally with sin on their souls so that he could save them. Number five. In the case of an emergency, anyone can baptize provided that he or she has the intention of doing what the church does. Number six, in the sacrament of baptism, a person is adopted by grace as a child of God, the father to live as a priest, prophet, and king. Number seven, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit are received for the first time in the sacrament of confirmation. Eight, the event in scripture that corresponds to the sacrament of confirmation is Pentecost as described in the book of Acts. Number nine, the holy sacrifice of the mass is an unbloody representation of Christ's bloody sacrifice on Calvary's cross and also a representation of the Last Supper. Number 10, it is actually a duty for a Christian always and everywhere to give God thanks. We're halfway there. Number 11, since venial sins are so common, Mother Church does not encourage her members to confess them in the sacrament of reconciliation. Number 12, to receive the grace of reconciliation, a person after a careful examination of conscience must give the name and number of times one has committed all grave sin not yet confessed, if there are any. Number 13, whenever we are sick, we know that Christ is with us because he is the suffering servant who took our infirmities and bore our diseases. 14, true or false, the primary effect of the anointing of the sick is restoration of physical health. 15, a person is not responsible for accepting and embracing the sex of his or her birth. Last five, 16, a female is never truly made in God's image and likeness because God has revealed that he is male as shown in God the Father and God the Son. <clears throat> Lots of conversation on that one. <laughs> Number 17, God created male and female for conflict so that they become stronger through this conflict. <laughs> Great conversation we're going to have here, Father Jack. 18, for a marriage to be true in God's eyes, couples must intend a free Total, faithful, and fruitful covenant love. 19. We do not see actual bishops, priests, and deacons in the Christian church until the rule of the Roman Empire Constantine in the 4th century AD. And we made it. Number 20. Deacons, priests, and bishops are exclusively ordained by a bishop. 20 true or false questions. Five minutes for discussion. It is time for the test.
questions. Number one. At now, what are we doing? We're trying to overview sacraments, and they're related to events. So sacraments are related to all the events of our life, and I was just trying to get a different spin on them, so I came up with a whole new set of questions. But I went through each of the presentations, each of the sacraments. So at the particular judgment, a person's soul separates from his or her body, and after God's judgment, goes either to heaven, hell, or purgatory. True or false? That is as true as true could be. Okay, so there you go. That's the particular judgment. We should be preparing for it. Um, not the final judgment, the particular judgment. That's when your soul separates from your body. The general judgment is at the end of time. And at that time, there will only be a heaven or hell. At this time, there's still a purgatory. Number two, the sacraments of Christian initiation are baptism, reconciliation, and Eucharist. And we know the answer to that is false. There you go. And the normal order for the sacrament traditionally was baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. And I would like that to be restored someday, um, but that's just my opinion. Number three, everlasting love is ultimately determined uniquely by each individual human person according to his or her particular view and views and feelings. True or false? Now, the only reason I put this in here, this is the view of love in our culture. And it's deeply rooted that we self-define what love is. God is love. <laughs> okay. And we either unite ourselves to that love or we do not. Okay. So this, and this is a very subtle thing. So this is how when, for example, uh, same-sex marriage is made legal, right? What is it said? This is a victory for, it says it's a victory for love, right? And if you don't agree with this, you hate me, okay? So you got to see the co-opting of language and the saying everything is defined only relatively in relation to what I believe and you have to affirm whatever I believe even if it's not true. That's a huge problem. That's why I put that question in there. Number four, God created man and woman originally with sin on their souls so that he could save them. True or false? Okay, you know, it's not like God made us bad so that he could save us. He made us free so that he could love us. Okay, we got to remember that. He didn't make us bad so that he could save us. He made us free so that he could love us. And then he said, I'm going to even come back and save you once you've denied my love. Okay, what is the denial of God's love? When I say I define what is true or false, that's what eating the, the tree is. Once you do that, you deny love because love is either true or it's not true. It's either authentically in line with God's creation or not. There you go. False. Number five, in the case of an emergency, anyone can baptize, provided that he or she has the intention of doing what the church does. True or false? True. Okay. Now, what that means is, I just intend to do what the church does. I baptize in water, and then the church is the one that really supplies all the other stuff like, what does this mean, and so forth, okay? It's a very limited, why? Because we want to make baptism something that can happen in any emergency circumstance, right? In danger of death. So we want to say, God can work through any individual as long as they intend what this church understands this event to be. Okay, it's, it's actually very wise of the church. I used to be kind of have difficulties with this, but I have less, so, oh, sorry. Oh, here we go. That was really scary. In the sacrament of baptism, a person is adopted by grace as a child of God the Father to live as priest, prophet, and king. Is that true or false? True. Now, I want to remember this because people say, why can't women be priests in the church? I say they are. By their baptism, right? They're the ordinary... Uh, priesthood, meaning that they are offering their life in sacrifice to the Father and giving Christ to others through their life, and they're doing that as a priest in the ordinary sense. I'm an ordained priest to specifically give Christ to you in the most blessed sacrament to live that out, you see? So, but really, uh, women are priests, prophets, and kings in our church. Women are even kings. We don't even call them queens. We call them kings. And Jesus, why? A woman reflects Christ in a particular way. Okay? All right? 
So we're not going to make Christ androgynous. He indeed is a male. We are going to say, however, the way he's going to reflect his, as the perfect image of the Father, the way he's going to reflect his perfect image of the Father in a woman is different than the way I will. Okay, and that, that's, that's a fact. Uh, number seven, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit are received for the first time in the sacrament of confirmation. Is that true or false? False, they're received at baptism. Number eight, the event in scripture that corresponds to the sacrament of confirmation is Pentecost as described in the book of Acts. Is that true or false? True, and we get the, the third, we get uh, the Holy Spirit as that personal relationship to that love of God. Number nine, the holy sacrifice of the mass is an unbloody representation of Christ's bloody sacrifice on Calvary's cross and also a rep representation of the Last Supper. True or false? True, it's both supper and sacrifice. Number 10, it is actually a duty for a Christian always and everywhere to give thanks to God. Is that true or false? True, it's your duty always and everywhere to give thanks. Now, don't be morbid or twisted. So I'm going, let's say, and I have to go anoint a woman who has metastasized cancer, stage four. Go, thank you, Lord. No, I, I say... Thank you, Lord, that I can be of service to this woman. Thank you, Lord, for the life that she has. Um, I don't understand the mystery of suffering, whether that be moral or physical. But I thank you for the life that she's had. Okay, not, I'm not thanking God for the cruel ravages of the cancer. I'm thanking God for the life and the ability to endure that with the cross. Does that make sense? We, we don't want to get sick. We want to look at things realistically. I'm thanking you that I'm not scared. In other words, if I didn't know Jesus, I'd be too scared to go visit her. What could I say? Nothing. Okay. But what I say is I thank you that I actually have a message I can deliver of hope, a message of love, a message of healing, that I have a message to deliver because if I didn't have that message, I might just say, listen, we, we can get some pills, some cyanide pills and just give them to you now. You understand what I'm saying? That's what the culture says. We have no message for you except to die. Okay, we say, no, we have a message for you, which is live in your suffering and rise with Christ. You see, I mean, think about that. I'm thankful for that. And number 11, here we go. Uh, since venial sins are so common, the mother church does not encourage her members to confess them in the sacrament of reconciliation. True or false? False, we want to weed out the garden, even if it's not going to destroy, the, uh, it's going to inhibit their ability to grow. Number 12, to receive the grace of reconciliation, a person after a careful examination of conscience must give the name and number of times one has committed all grave sins not yet confessed, if there are any. Is that true or false? That is called an integral confession. I'd read all that and make sure all that's done every time you go to confession. Number 13, whenever we are sick, we know that Christ is with us because he is the suffering servant who took our infirmities and bore our diseases. True or false? True, yes, he's just giving us a share in the suffering he's already endured in his body. Number 14, the primary effect of anointing of the sick is restoration of physical health. True or false? False, it may not happen, but it will unite that suffering to the cross of Christ. Number 15, a person is not responsible for accepting and embracing the sex of his or her birth. True or false? False acceptance of your sex is actually important sense of your gratitude. It says it in the catechism. You're just supposed to go, I am glad I was born this way. And we see it as a psychological problem if a person actually has difficulty accepting that. And we don't, meaning that, we want to help them to do what? Accept it, not to have an operation to change how they appear, which is not going to change the fact that they are male or female. Okay? Number 16. A female is never truly made in God's image and likeness because God has revealed that he is male, as shown in God the Father and God the Son. False, okay? Uh, there we go. Remember, the female comes from the male, right? Originally. So Adam, and he sees bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. There's this deep relationship to us, but there's a complementary difference that God has created. But both reflect the image of God. It says, let us make man in our image, male and female, he made them. That's what the church teaches. He's, God's ultimately neither male nor female. That's the point. Okay, but we as males and females reflect him. Number 17, God created male and female for conflict so that they become stronger through this conflict. That is Darwinism. 
that is communism. That's what it teaches, okay? That if there is a God, he's just created this conflict. We need to get rid of it. Number 18, for a marriage to be true in God's eyes, couples must intend a free, total, faithful, and fruitful covenant love. True or false? True at number 19. We do not see actual, excuse me, we do not see actual bishops, priests, and deacons in the Christian church until the rule of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century AD. True or false? This is a commonly proposed idea, by the way. And number 20, deacons, priests, and bishops are exclusively ordained by a bishop. True indeed. There we go. All right, ready to move on to something else here. Thank you, Father Jack. I'm glad to know I was not created for conflict with my husband. That's fantastic. <laughs> I knew I had another purpose in life. We're so, <laughs> thank you for all those questions. We, we've got a really, really fun show for you today, and we want to share just a couple more things with you. The blood drive, they had a little computer glitch earlier. They're back on, they're ready, and they need your blood. So if you had, had made an appointment, please come back. They're ready to do that, and they do have openings, and there is an urgent need. Um, so please participate in that if you can. A lot of really great events that are going to be coming up. May 17th, the Knights have Trivia Night, which is going to be fun. Please come out, participate in that. There's information in the bulletin on that. May 19th, two weeks from today, uh, the March for Life will have information night about, or I'm sorry, information morning about the March for Life. Please come to that. There'll be coffee and donuts during this time frame, and you can learn about how you can participate next year. Eucharistic Congress is coming up June 21st and 22nd, and we really want all of you to be there. This is going to transform your faith to attend this event, so please come out and, and experience um, a weekend with your fellow Catholics that, like you've never had before. And then we'll be back. We're really going to miss you this summer. I mean, this is our family, so we will see you September 8th, but... Do not worry, because you can find us on social media, YouTube. If you missed a witness, last week's witness with Father Tran was spectacular. And so please go back and view that if you missed that or any of our witnesses this year. Let's give a warm thanks to all the witnesses and Father Jack's work this year. We are so blessed, and we're so blessed again to celebrate 20 years for you this year, Father Jack. We're excited about that. And because we are so excited about all that you teach us, we have a very special video that we're going to queue up here for you, and it's Father Jack's Greatest Hits. Are we ready, guys? Let's roll. I'll have to say this. My self-love, in part, is based on I'm mysterious to myself. <laughs> I, I mean, sometimes I go like, that's so weird. I never thought I would do that. And I actually go, that's really awesome. Okay? So, like, I'm still surprising myself. I mean, think about it. And I go, I am! You're right! Only God could do that. Okay, so I remember I met this man, and uh, I said, well, no, wait a second. You're saying this about the Catholic Church. Let's think for you. I don't think. I just believe. I go like, whoa. Heaven is full of uh, those creatures made by God who said, I am not God, <laughs> and glad of it. <laughs> no ambition in heaven. That's what makes it so good. Now, personally, if I had been able to speak, I would have been really kind of grossed out, even with Christ's spittle getting on my tongue. But I might have desired to speak enough to say, loosen it up with that spittle. If it's going to be that spittle, I'll accept it. We listen to EWTN. They have that, that woman with that British accent saying that. You can say it like that. My Jesus. I go like, wow. I, I think Jesus probably listens to her a lot more quickly than me, right? You know, it's, uh, I've shared with you how I pray the rosary. Endorphins help me meditate. Okay, so the way I actually pray the rosary each day is I need to stay fit. Every woman in the parish wants to feed me and get me fat. I say, you're not going to give me a heart attack. Every woman in Philadelphia has done that to her man. 
you know, because they view them Taylor pork roll, hoagies, pizza, and everything else. All these poor guys, 55, 60, having heart attacks. Not me, baby. <laughs> Can we pay for a nice trip for you to go to such and such and so and so? No! No, you can't! <laughs> I'll go to hell! There are areas where we have to leave it up to God because we don't have the specific answers. Okay? Now, for some of you, it just drives you crazy, that area that just drives you nuts. It's like, oh, I want, to, I want an answer, a definitive answer. I want to corner God. I don't want to leave any wiggle room. I got one table over here of non-wiggle room people, that whole table over there. Again, if you, if you can go where? To the Vatican website, the compendium of the catechism of the Catholic Church, numbers 188 to 199. Next week, I'm giving you a test, and you have to be able to give me the answer to the exact sections in the compendium of the catechism of the Catholic Church. No, actually, you don't need to do that. I just lied to you. That's terrible. I will confess that this week when I go to confession. I never thought I'd have to think about paving parking lots. But I do. It's all part of the incarnational reality we live in. And how many of us can say, I learned more from my poor decisions than from my good ones? Okay. Hey, yes, I'm serious. I'm going to like, I learned a lot from that. <laughs> there was a lot of instruction here. I was like, this is the most amazing thing. That in this prayer, the woman heard the Lord say to her, beer, B-E-E-R. I'm saying, no, this is what the Lord said to you, yes. And that her mother, who was ill and said terminally ill, that the Lord was calling her to give her just little sips of beer, and she was healed. I said, amen. <laughs> I said, that is a story I want to hear every week. Amen. Cool, huh? Church, actually, people who write the liturgy, they thought about it, <laughs> prayed about it. It's not, oh, we'll just do this. Old man just trying to be cranky and just come up with something. No, this is something that has been thought out through 2,000 years. I've been listening to Jesus before the Blessed Sacrament, writing that homily. My heart's burning. Okay? And, and we're all just called to be a hunk of hunk of burning love, as, as our, our, our man Elvis would say. And has an idea that we haven't thought of. And it's always a better idea. <laughs> I guarantee you the way the church is formed, no one would think of, hey, you need to form a corporation where everybody abandons you very soon. You don't have to confess all of your venial sins, but you must confess all of your grave sins, okay, for you to be forgiven. Does it make sense? Okay, you know, so uh, sometimes that's helpful to remember there's like a really long line and only a few priests, okay? All right, here you go. That's why I threw that in there. I need, I need to start speaking more gently to my spouse. The way I've been approaching is without charity. It hasn't been over the top. It's just been grouchiness, but I need to change this. I see spouses over there just giggling and everything about this. Okay. So, all right. So we've been working on this for what? 50 years? I mean, come on. Okay. Planes going down. Anybody Catholic? Any, if you're not Catholic, it's time for you to acknowledge your sins before the Lord. All the sins that you remember. You might unintentionally forget one. You're absolved of all your sins. Okay? Remember. Why? Because God's not like, you missed it. Too bad. Go to hell. <laughs> that's, that's how we love. That's how we live. I love it because it's like a game. Oh, look at this person. Woo. Hating on me. Send me that mean email. <laughs> this is going to be fun. I, seriously, I go, like, this is going to be great. I'm looking forward to this. And then finally... A revolt against God. How can God allow this to happen to me? Look at all the responsibilities I have. So forth. Not that any of you have ever responded that way, but I'm just giving you some examples. Those are from the catechism. Number two. That was a joke, by the way. You don't have to go seeking suffering. It will come to you. Okay. It'll come to you. You don't need to make up your own sufferings. Okay. But you go like, but what about just the stuff that you actually have to face today? You want to run away from that very often, okay? Let's look around the room. I can see a lot of suffering going on in here. Then a lot of anointings and visits. There we go. So, <laughs> this is going to be hard to take me seriously for where this, this is, it is kind of hard, I agree. I got a lot of information, folks. I've never been married, but I've heard all about what doesn't work. <laughs> I may be getting a suntan in Desmond, but I'll be getting a real suntan down in hell. I'll tell you that right now. Whoever knew. Even Three Dog Night, who spoke about being one, understood this. I would always find this frustrating thing when I look at myself. I'm, I'm not too impressed. But when I look at the father looking at me, I go, wow. <laughs> All right. 
I'm a dude. I'm a son of God. Gave this, you were talking to me. I heard everything you said. He, he recovered and got up, walked out. Okay? But I, I, was, I didn't go in there and go like, well, it looks like he's about gone. <laughs> Let me just slap this on. There we go. Right on time. That's amazing. Unbelievable. Inconceivable. Go. Morning prayer. Do that. Mental prayer. Do that. Examination of conscience. Do that. Let's stand up and go. In the Middle Ages, there was no filming. <laughs> It'll make me think a whole lot about what I say and when I say it and how I say it. Okay, with that, uh, I don't know if that's encouragement or discouragement for next year, but I, I may come up here again. Um, now, we do have a summer mission. And they're showing us on the screen. So here's a couple of things that I wanted to suggest to you before we depart. We're going to depart uh, just a few minutes later. It'll be 10.20 rather than 10.15. But what I'd like, I'd like you to consider this. What I've done is I've taken what we do every Easter and I've invited you to rephrase it rather than answering a question just to make a statement. I renounce sin so as to live in the freedom of the children of God. You see what I'm saying? So what this is, is basically your baptismal promises made into statements. This would be a great way to start your day. Renew your baptismal promises every morning. Okay? I think that's a good idea. And let's see what else. Is that all we had on that? Do we have anything else for, for the summer mission? I think I had some other things down there, but if it didn't get on there, it may not have. Uh, it may not have gotten on my sheet. Let's see. Yes, that's one thing we're doing. Let's see if there's anything else. There's nothing else. On the sheets, was there something else? Okay. Yes, so if you look on your sheet that you have at your table, what I'd like you to do is to consider just a couple things. First of all, your recreation. When you go on trips, consult Christ first. Think about that first. Whenever I consider a vacation or anything, I'm always saying, for me at least, where can I celebrate Mass? Where can I adore Jesus and bless the sacrament? I start with that. Then everything else is worked around that. You need as a family to consider who you focused on even when you go on a trip. Okay? Also, summer reading... I've given you some reading in the catechism. We're going to be looking at the section on Christian life. Uh, deeper cooperation with sacramental grace. I've given you some steps that I think might be very simple but be helpful in growing closer to Christ through the sacraments he gives us. And then renewing your baptismal promises on a daily basis. So these are just a few little things to kind of tweak what we've been doing and just kind of add a little STP to it over the summer. Um, so I just invite you to consider these things, to read through these things. But I was really thinking if we got on our knees in the morning and renewed our baptismal promises, it would get us refocused on what is essential to us as children of God, would it not? So let us now all stand. I want to thank, uh, let's give an applause for all the Ablaze team that works so hard throughout the year. We've been meeting, we're already planning for next year. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic team, very dedicated, very devoted, very hardworking. And let us turn to our mother as the month of May, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord.